here we go. I think we got it working. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to work through chapter one, um, week one, the study of life. And we're going to talk about the basics of what is biology and what is science and uh, kind of go over that information, give you maybe a little bit of conversation, a little bit of story that kind of helps you understand it. So when we talk about biology, we're talking about the study of life. And one of the oldest living things that we see on our planet is the cyanobacteria or the blue-green algae. Um, life can come in many different forms and it can come from something as simple as the blue-green algae you see on the screen to something as complex such as humans and, and elephants and groves of trees and such as that. But the thing that all living things have in common is um, a defined set of characteristics. And one of the things that we're going to talk about today are those defined set of characteristics and uh, and how they help to explain what life is and what life isn't. The picture on the right is called a stromatolite. You can see right here next to the green bee, a stromatolite. And a stromatolite is literally just layers of these blue-green algae, these cells right here, layers of them that kind of fossilize and, and form these structures. Um, why do we study biology? Why is the study of life important? Um, what do we get from studying biology? Um, when we study biology, we're studying living organisms, and we're not only studying just the structure of those organisms, but also how they interact with each other and how they interact with their environment. Um, biology permeates everyday life. I tell my kids, um, when we study biology, we study life as in science and life as in the things surrounding you in your everyday um, activities. So for instance, sometimes that you might have seen uh, biology in the news would be with Escherichia coli. Um, that's this word right here, Escherichia coli. You probably know it as E. coli or salmonella outbreaks. Um, these are common bacterial outbreaks that can make people sick and they'll put on the news that uh, there's a possible salmonella contamination or there's an E. coli outbreak. Um, when we talk about E. coli and salmonella, we're talking about structures um, such as bacteria that have the ability to produce toxins and things that can make us sick. E. coli, like you see in the micrograph in the corner, is a common bacteria that's found in um, the digestive tracts of living organisms. And sometimes when we ingest something that has a different strand of E. coli from the one that we're used to, it can make us sick and you know, diarrhea and dehydration. It can be pretty bad. Some strands of E. coli can um, actually produce a toxin that can be very hard to get rid of. So when we understand life and we understand how living organisms function, it helps us to protect ourselves from things that might make us sick. Um, it helps us to cure diseases. So if we understand how genetic diseases work, how genetic diseases are passed on from generation to generation, then we have a better understanding of how we need to proceed or where we need to go in order to maybe help stop these these genetic diseases. And understanding biology and understanding the ecosystem and organisms within helps us understand how we can protect the planet. We live in the planet, we have to use the resources that are in the planet, but we also need to protect the planet so those resources are available for us and also for other organisms that we live with on the planet. Um, when we talk about science, we talk about the scientific method and we've learned the scientific method. I learned the scientific method as kind of a linear flow chart. We start with a question, a hypothesis, experimentation, analysis, conclusion. Um, science, when you're doing science, uh, it's more of a cycle that you can jump in and out of at any, at any point in time. But it's a general guideline for doing science. It allows us to pose testable questions and seek data science-based results. Um, the scientific method and doing science is very logical. It's very rational. It's very problem solving. It's methodic. Um, we like data. We don't like feelings. And it's, it's not very fuzzy. It can sometimes feel cold, but it's nice that we have you know, the data or the information to back up the statements that we make in science. Um, we always have a question that we're investigating. Sometimes that question comes from the very beginning. Sometimes that question might be developed when we're doing something else. We might be working in one way and say, oh, well, what about this? And then that might drive our research in a different direction. But the most important thing about scientific questions is that they are testable. So we have to be able to have 
questions that we can answer and that we can answer with data and information and observation. Um, another part of the scientific method is the hypothesis. This is the, the traditional if-then statement. Um, we're taught that it's a prediction, but it's not just a prediction. It's a prediction that explains, it explains what's going on. So maybe instead of saying if-then, it's if then because. Um, a good example of an if then because hypothesis would be um, maybe with plants. I I like to garden. I like to be out in the plants. I have several plants in my classroom. They make me happy. Um, so if I give my plants more light, then they will grow because they have more energy available to them. So I, I kind of tie in that if then and then explain why I think that these the if as related to the then. Um, hypothesis are different from theory. Um, hypothesis are tested um, locally. Um, theories kind of bring together multiple hypotheses and help to support maybe one generalized statement. Um, they're, they're very well tested. Um, they're, they're conformed explanations or confirmed explanations. So you might have a theory and you might have several different scientists that are bringing in information and data and hypothesis to support that theory. Um, hypothesis have to be falsifiable. We have to be able to say, no, this is incorrect. Um, science is good about saying, no, this is incorrect, but they, they're not, we're not very good about saying, yes, this is for sure correct. And we'll talk more about that later. So for example, the, the classroom is warm because no one turned on the air conditioner. So we can come into the classroom and we can see if the air conditioner is off or on. So we can either support that hypothesis or um, falsify that hypothesis. Uh, and this is just that linear flow chart. And it's just a great example of how we learn it in a linear way, but we need to understand that it doesn't necessarily happen like that. So I might be here making predictions and doing the experiment, and I might have another question that comes out of that where I want to research and go maybe in a different direction. Um, when we do science, when we do experimentation, it's important that we do controlled experiments. In a controlled experiment, we are regulating our variables. We are specifically manipulating one variable, the independent variable, so that we can see the effect that it has on the dependent variable. So what is the effect, if I go back to my hypothesis, what is the effect of light on plant growth? So the independent variable would be light because I'm varying that. And then the dependent variable would be plant growth. And that's what's changing because of what I do. Now, in a controlled experiment, I have to make sure the only thing that's affecting that plant growth is light, is that one variable I want to change. If I don't control all the other variables, it might affect my results. If I don't control how much water is coming, how much fertilization it gets, how much space it has to grow, those things might affect the growth of my plant. So I control everything. I give every plant the same amount of water. Every plant has the same amount of space. Every plant has the same fertilizer. And I only change that one variable. Once we have our results from our experiment, we have our data, we analyze that data to look to see what's going on. Um, we look at it compared to our hypothesis. We look at it compared to maybe some previous research. And we will look at that hypothesis and say, yes, that hypothesis is rejected. Um, it, does not, uh, it, it's not supported by the data, or we say that the hypothesis is supported. We don't say a hypothesis is correct. We don't say a hypothesis is definitely yes or, or because we don't know that it's definitely yes. We only know the information that we have currently. Um, that's called provisional assent. Nothing is ever finally proven. We only know all of the information we have until this point. We understand that later on, other people might be doing research or might be doing experiments and they might find more information that could adjust what we think and what we know. And we see this throughout time. Um, you know, that they used to think that the sun, the, or rather the earth was the center of the universe. And then physicists and, and um, people studied that. And now we know that the sun is the center of the earth. 
the universe. Um, another example would be the atom. The ancient Greeks thought the atom was a solid particle. Uh, it didn't have any differences in it. It was just like a marble. Uh, we know over time that we, we've discovered negative particles. We've discovered positive particles. Well, if you've got parts, you're, you don't have that solid one consistent material. So that hypothesis, that model has changed over time till we get to what we have now, which is the electron cloud model. So as we gain more information, we adapt what we know and we can make better decisions. It's kind of like if you're, you're researching what kind of car to buy. So as you research and know more, you're able to make better decisions. You have better data and you have a better understanding. Um, so when we talk about provisional ascent, we understand that every assertion regarding the natural world is subject to change and is, um, revised based solely on evidence. So we can't just change things because we want it. We have to have the data to support that. We also know that all of our scientific hypotheses have to be falsifiable or they have to be open to negation. We have to be able to say, this is not true. Um, this is not supported. Um, we also have to be able to say this is supported. Notice I'm not saying that it is true or it is fact. We just say that our current data supports this hypothesis. Um, scientific inquiry itself only deals with natural or natural explanations for the natural world. So we are we are looking at explanations, um, not opinions. We're looking for data. We're looking for observations. We're looking for things that are repeatable. And we're talking about the natural world. All right. Um, I'm not saying that science is separate from morality. I'm just saying that science looks at what we can do and looks how we can do it. And then morality comes in and says, should we do it? Um, so it's just science is focused based on mainly on facts. It's focused on data and information and it's answering questions about natural world and natural phenomenon. Science is going to be isn't going to be able to answer the question as, as to what your favorite color is, because that's a personal belief. That's a personal opinion. Um, when we talk about the different types of science, there's basic science, which is your pure science. Think research. Um, so an example of this would be the Human Genome Project, where we were, the Human Genome Project was a project in which they were trying to map the entire human genome and figure out what genes belong where and what do these do. This is to expand research regardless of application. We want to know more, so let's learn more. And then we have applied science, and you probably know this better as technology. And technology takes that basic pure science and applies it so that it's usable. So now that we know what the entire human genome is, how can we use that? And we use it to, you know, identify genetic diseases, identify risks for different things, risk factors within your life. Um, maybe we can use it to help develop um, cures for those genetic diseases or even prevent them from happening in the first place. So with our basic science, we're expanding our knowledge and technology allows us to apply what we know so that we can use it. So they're connected. It's hard, it's hard sometimes to separate basic or pure science from the technology because um, in everyday life, we don't learn about the science until it becomes applied, but they are two different things. Um, sometimes discoveries happen because we're looking for them. And sometimes discoveries happen because of chance. It's the eureka moment. So they happen in both ways. So what we see here is a brown pelican that was um, struck by Hurricane Ike. Um, what we know about pelicans, what we know about their anatomy and physiology, what we know about their habitats, the foods they eat, that's pure science. Being able to take that information and treat the pelican so that it can heal, so that it can um, get better, go back to its natural environment, that's more of a technological approach. So we're applying that information we learn so that we can use it in the field. And this is just the, this is literally just the logo for the Human Genome Project that we talked about earlier. So we're learning about um, the human genome, the DNA, the genes that make up the genome. And then we can take that and apply that to, you know, it says engineering, genetic engineering. How can we make a stronger, better, more resistant um, organism that, that allows it to flourish in the ecosystem? Um, should we? do that? And then what can we learn from things like the human genome? 
Um, as we talk about what we can learn from things we can learn from the human genome, that kind of leads us to our next topic, which is communication within science. Communication and collaboration is essential for scientific researchers to be able to grow, to combine their knowledge and build upon previous discoveries. Um, in the modern age, this is, is easier than ever before. You can go online and you can get scientific research journals and you can read current science. You can share it. Um, email to email, where before, like way back when, um, you know, it took a long time to communicate and collaborate. Um, so communication and collaboration is very important because it allows us to do things like peer review. And what peer review is, when you break down that word peer, um, that's a friend or a cohort of the same age group. In this case, it's a scientist that studies the same things that you study. So maybe I'm a scientist that studies how the muscles in the upper arm work, and I'm trying to figure something out. And I think I've done this experiment, it's great. I think the data is amazing. I wanna share that information with other scientists that understand how muscles in the arm work um, so that they can look at my data and they can look at my research and, and say, hey, this is repeatable. You did a great job. I think you're onto something. Or they might say, hey, um, you might want to think about this, or you don't have enough subjects within this research. You need to give us some more examples. You need to give us some more trials. So communication and collaboration is very important when combined with peer review because it helps to ensure that science that goes out into the general public is reproducible. It helps to ensure that science in the general public um, has good data pools and it has good information that we can use that. Um, there have been cases in the past when scientists have released information and it's not reproducible or um, there isn't enough information or data in the data pool. So maybe they only did two subjects instead of 20. And so when it, when it comes down, when you, when you increase that, that data pool, the findings aren't the same. So it's very important that we use communication and peer review to help ensure that the science that does reach um, publication, the science that does reach the general public is good science. And sometimes it sneaks through the cracks, but um, scientists work really hard to ensure that it doesn't, to ensure that the science that, that makes it out in the real world is uh, valid and helpful. Um, which leads us to let's just focus more exactly on biology. So we've kind of just finished scientific inquiry and the nature of science. And let's focus a little bit on the meat of the class, which is biology. So I said in the very beginning um, that there was a set of characteristics that help define life. Um, these characteristics are viewed as a group they're, they are not viewed individually, so collectively, these characteristics define all living organisms. Now, I say that collectively or as a group, they define living organisms because when we look at them separately, like if we look just at reproduction, we can use that characteristic to define, define non-living things. A copy machine reproduces. That's the whole point of the copy machine. It just makes more and more and more and more. All right, um, adaptation, uh, that's change over time within a population. Just think about how cell phones have changed um, in your lifetime. I know when my first cell phone was a really chunky flip phone and then we got the skinny razors and everyone was really excited and now we got these nice big iPhones. And how are those cell phones gonna change in the future? So we can look at these individual characteristics and define non-living things with them. But when you group them together, um, it allows us to define living things. So all living things have all of these together. So starting with order, all living things have le levels of organization. Um, they have complexity, whether you're talking about a single celled organism, such as the bacteria that we talked about in the beginning of the lecture, the E. coli, or multi multicellular organisms like our toad here. Um, they all have order, they have organization, and they're made up of the cell, and some of them are made up of more cells, um, but they all have that that organization. Now, some organisms, such as E. coli, um, are very simple organisms. They have a strand of DNA, they have some ribosomes to make proteins, um, they have a cell membrane, they might have a coat, 
um, but they are pretty basic organisms. And some organisms, such as our toad, are very complex organisms. They're made up of tissues and organs and organ systems, and their cells themselves are more complex because they have a nucleus and they have ribosomes and endocrine plasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and vacuoles, and they have all a lot more complexity than, you know, that simple E. coli does. And a lot of that is related to the DNA, and a lot of that is related to, you know, the complexity of the cell allows for a more complex organism. So that is a very important characteristic. Another characteristic, um, I have a bunch of GIFs here to help illustrate this one, because this one's just a fun characteristic. It's a lot easier to see and understand than it is to just hear it. So what you're seeing in the middle of this screen is a sugar crystal. So think glucose um, or think table sugar. That would be sucrose. And then what's moving towards that sucrose is a bacteria, right? Lots of bacteria. And they are attracted to the glucose. It's a process called chemotaxis. So the chemo is a chemical and taxis is movement. And literally with chemotaxis, there's a chemical signal in this case, our glucose molecule, and it's attracting those bacteria to come into it. So they are moving towards that glucose. So the stimulus here is the, is the sugar, uh, glucose, sucrose, whatever it is. And then the response is the bacteria are moving to it. So organisms are able to respond to stimulus. And we see this every day. Um, if you put your hand on a hot stove or it's really hot out, you buckle your seatbelt and you accidentally touch that hot seatbelt buckle, you react to that. We understand that with humans. Um, we don't necessarily always understand that with plants. Plants also are sensitive to stimulus and they will respond to stimulus. And this is a process called phototropism. In phototropism, the plants are growing or moving towards that light. Um, you would probably, if you have house plants or if you have plants um, that are sitting in a place that's partially shaded and partially sunny, so for instance, I have some plants on my windowsill in my kitchen, um, I have to rotate those plants every once in a while because they will start to grow towards the window. Um, and, and that's just a natural response. They want to move towards the light. The light is what's producing or providing the energy so that they can grow and they can produce those sugars in photosynthesis. And another example of a plant responding to uh, stimuli is the sensitive briar plant. So it literally folds up when it, when it gets bumped. It's pretty cool. Um, this is native to Missouri. So in the back roads and byways, you might come across this plant. Um, but yeah, when you touch it, it closes up. So that kind of makes you wonder, what is the function of this? Why is it closing up? So can you think of any reasons why this sensitive briar would be closing up when it gets touched? Another um, characteristic of all living things is reproduction. Everything reproduces. Um, if we don't reproduce, then that particular cell line or that particular gene line does not go on. So when we look at species as a group, not individual species as a group, um, organisms as a group, they, they go through reproduction. If you are a single celled organism, like the bacteria that's shown in this gift down here, uh, cell division uh, known as binary fission, very similar to mitosis, is how you reproduce. They are literally just splitting in half and that's how they're growing. Um, multicellular organisms like humans, like plants, uh, re have reproductive germ lines. So this is the process of meiosis. And then we're producing in the humans, egg and sperm, and those egg and sperm join during fertilization and form new individuals. So that's how multicellular organisms reproduce. It's important that multicellular organisms reproduce um, biologically, because it allows for the continuing of the species and allows for genes to move from parents to offspring so that um, that genetic information moves on. So we have to remember that biology is um, living organisms. They're there to eat, survive, and reproduce. And eating and surviving allows them to reproduce. Another characteristic is growth and development. So once we go through reproduction, our cells will continue to divide. You'll see increase in number. You'll see increase in size, especially if you're a multicellular organism like the cat. And you will develop into organisms. We talk about embryos as they develop after fertilization. You know, they divide in half and then they divide again and then divide again. And then eventually we start getting things like a nervous system and a, and a cardiovascular system. And you see characteristics such as 
a cat start to appear. Um, if you know much about DNA, you understand that that DNA is passed from parents to offspring, and that determines the characteristics of the offspring, which is why most organisms have characteristics of their parents. Another one is regulation, another trait. Um, regulation is important to the coordination of functions within systems. Um, we understand that we as a human as a, are a system or that cat in the previous slide is a system, but it's also made up of systems and those systems will interact. And those systems allow for response to stimulus and they allow organisms to cope with changes in their environment. So it's important that it works. So for instance, if I decide to go running, you know, it's pretty serious if I'm running. Um, but if I decide to go running, my muscles are burning energy. And in order to make more energy, my muscles need glucose, so essentially food, and also oxygen. So my muscular systems are interacting with digestive system um, to break down that, my food to get to glucose form. They're interacting with the cardiovascular system to transport that glucose to my muscles. And also interacting with the respiratory system. And we're bringing in oxygen to the, once again, cardiovascular system so that we can make more ATP so that our muscles can function better. So regulation is very important. It's also very tied to our next characteristic, which is homeostasis. Homeostasis is the maintenance of an internal condition so that cells can function properly. With homeostasis, we're only maintaining what is going on within our body and what is going on with our cells. Just like in real life, we can't control what's going on around us. We can only control and maintain what is going on within us. Um, so our bodies maintain, maintain temperature. If we get too hot, we sweat. If we get too cold, we shiver. Um, we'll maintain pH. If it becomes too acidic, proteins don't work. Um, if it becomes too basic, proteins don't work. So there's a there's a Goldilocks range of pH within our bodies that work that helps um, our bodies function correctly. And it may be different in different locations. So for instance, in your stomach, the pH for optimal functioning is about a two, which is very, very acidic. But in our blood, it's just a little bit over seven, which is a little bit more basic. So different places can have different requirements. And homeostasis is what allows us to maintain those requirements. Um, Energy processing is extremely important. If we do not have energy, we cannot live. And we get it from different ways. We understand that plants get their energy through the process of photosynthesis. So we use the sunlight, or we, the plants use the sunlight so that we can um, convert carbon dioxide and water into stored glucose energy. So we combine the energy from the sun, energy from carbon, the energy from water, and we, we grow a plant. And that's how they, they process their energy. And then they break it down so they can use it. We process energy because we're eating. So we ingest food, we break it down, and then we use it through cellular respiration. And it's used to power our metabolic processes. And our metabolic processes are just the processes that either help to make new things or break down things so that you can then make new things again. Now, photosynthesis, we understand. Um, consuming food, we understand. But they're not the only ways that organisms process energy. Um, if you go to areas where life exists, but no light exists, such as um, deep sea ocean vents. If you guys are planet Earth nuts, there's an episode that talks about deep sea ocean vents, um, planet Earth and life and stuff like that. So you look up deep sea ocean vents, and there's a whole community of organisms there, but there's no sunlight. Um, there's not a lot of food coming down from the surface of the water because it's so deep. So where is that energy coming from? And the answer is the energy is coming from the deep sea ocean vent. So there are bacteria down there that can process the energy from those sulfuric vents into carbon molecules that other organisms will eat and use to start their food chain. And if you watch that video, I mean, there's bacteria, there's shrimp, there's worms, there's crabs, there's a whole ecosystem down there surrounding that alternative energy source or what we would call alternative because we're used to photosynthesis and in, in, in consumption and in, in eating. So energy process, processing and how we're able to break it down and how we're able to obtain it is very important to life. Um, life is organize, organized. We talked a little bit about that um, as one of our characteristics. And this is just a breakdown of the organization and levels of organization in life. So all living things are made of cells. Um, 
multicellular organism is made of multiple cells. A single cellular organism is made of a single cell, but they are the basic structure of all living things. When you have multiple cells working together to perform a function, you have a tissue. So for instance, if I have a bunch of muscle cells working together to contract, I have muscle tissue. All right. If I have multiple tissues working together to perform a function, I have an organ. So if I take those contracting muscle cells and I join them together with blood, right, and nervous cells and um, connective tissues, I have an organ such as a bicep. Um, when those organs work together, you have an organ system. So if we look at all the muscles within our body, all the skeletal muscles within our body, you have that muscular system. Um, multiple organ systems working together give us an organism. So when you combine for humans, all of our different organ systems, so muscular, skeletal, endocrine, nervous, on and on and on, you have the organism that is a human. And then, let's see, where's it at? When you have multiple organisms of a single kind um, in a defined area, you have a population. So if you think about uh, the population signs that are outside your, your city limits, right? They're telling you the number of humans that live within that defined area. When you add the different populations in that defined area together, you have a community. Um, I live on a beef ranch, so we have pasture. And if I count the number of cows in a single pasture, I'm counting the population of cows. But if I include the number of grasses, um, the number of specific types of grasses, the number of trees, the specific types of trees, um, squirrels, coyotes, um, mice, bulls, insects, if I count all those different populations together in that defined area, I have a community. When you take the community and you add in abiotic or non-living factors together with that community, you're looking at an ecosystem. So if we go back to my population um, example, my pasture that has all these different living organisms in it, if I start thinking about the abiotic factors that affect that pasture, um, soil, uh, a water availability, sunlight, those things affect the organisms that live within that pasture because if if I'm not getting water, my grasses aren't growing. Um, if my grasses aren't growing, I'm probably not going to have the insects that eat those grasses. I'm probably not going to be able to have the insects. And if those insects aren't there, it's not going to be able to feed the birds that feed off of those insects. So when we look at ecosystems, um, it's very important that we understand the effects of the, the abiotic or non-living things have on the living things within that ecosystem. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind as humans living within our environment is that we have to use um, the biotic factors and the abiotic factors within our environment, but we have to use them in a way that it doesn't affect other things, that we can maintain our healthy ecosystem. Um, and then we have the biosphere. And the biosphere is anywhere life exists. And we want to say, oh, that's not too far up in the air and that's not too far down in the ground. But we have to remember that there are organisms that live in the extremes. There are organisms that live in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, um, a very low um, oxygen availability, but there's some bacteria that can live up there. There's bacteria that can live in the uh, waste, the water cooling pools of um, nuclear run or nuclear plants. So, you know, so they use water to help cool down those nuclear cells. There's bacteria that can live there that can withstand that radiation. Um, we talked about chemosynthesis at the deep ocean vents. There's life down there. So anywhere on our planet, in the atmosphere to the deep ocean vents where life can exist is our biosphere. Um, life is classified, uh, traditionally life is classified by physical traits, um, morphology, the structure of an organism, uh, what they look like, how they use their resources, um, and genetic traits and kind of combined. Um, as science is progressing, as technology is progressing, you know, we talked about the Human Genome Project, we're able to map the genomes of different organisms. And now genetics and gene exploration is playing a major role in the classification of organisms. So we're classifying them according to how similar their DNA is. We're classifying according to how they are structurally similar, the characteristics they have. So for instance, do they lay an egg? Do they not lay an egg? 
All right. Does that make them related or not related? Um, so classification of life is very important. And we, when we talked about, for instance, the hierarchy of life, understanding where those organisms are within the hierarchy, understanding where those organisms are within relationships between themselves helps us to understand those ecosystems and those in that biosphere. So we understand how and why life exists. And this last picture for our last slide shows the three main classifications of all living things. Now we can break down all life into a whole bunch of different groups when we're talking about species and subspecies um, and organisms and such as that. But we start with our classification by splitting them into three domains. The first domain in picture A is bacteria. So think your E. coli bacteria, think salmonella, uh, streptococcus, the stuff that causes strep throat, which is disgusting. Um, so bacteria is a domain of life. Uh, all of the organisms within that domain of life have certain characteristics. Um, those characteristics can be determined from running the genome of that bacteria or Maybe when we talk about the morphology, the structure, some bacteria have a thick wall. Um, some of them don't. So understanding the structures of the bacteria, understanding the genome of the bacteria helps us to classify what kind of bacteria it is. Um, when you look at picture B, you're looking at uh, a hot spring, it looks like. Mm, hot vent. Uh, it doesn't say where it's from, but think of like um, the hot vents in Yellowstone, like Old Faithful, that kind of hot vent. These are occupied by organisms found in the domain archaea. Um, that's this word right here, archaea. Archaea tend to be extremophiles. Um, they live in extreme areas such as hot sulfuric water vents. Um, so they can withstand a lot of extremes that maybe a normal bacteria can't. So this is an example of an organism that can, their homeostatic levels their regulation is very different from the regulation of E. coli or strep throat bacteria. Um, so they can handle different things. They have both contain homeostasis or use homeostasis, but they use them differently because they have different requirements. And then our third domain, sorry, I got off track a little bit there. Our third domain is eukarya or eukaryotes. Um, we are eukaryotes, you are eukaryotes. So plants and animals and fish and birds and all those things are eukaryo. And they're, they're classified together, they're grouped together. Um, they have different morphological or different structures that help them to classify that. So this is just a little bit of an introduction into what we're gonna be talking about this year. Um, I hope we have a great year. I think we will. We've got some interesting topics to talk about. Let me move that cursor off my face. So if you have any questions, shoot me an email or a mind message. Um, and post in the discussion board. Hopefully this helped. Um, I hope you guys have a great day.